Hello and welcome back to D6 Damage. Today we're doing a slightly different video. Usually we talk about mechanics and things that you would do to make the most powerful characters possible, but today we're talking about RP and some of the common mistakes that players make when they're playing their character. I am joined by D8. I've played a, with a couple groups now, three or four groups, and almost every time we've had either a new player or someone who's only played a, one or two games, people who are fairly new. And a problem that I've noticed is that a lot of people equate the class of your character to your character's personality. And what I mean by that is that uh, they think a cleric should be a cleric in one way, or a barbarian has to be stupid and angry all the time or a mage who's obsessed with knowledge, that kind of thing. Yeah, there's more than one way to play any of these characters, but occasionally people will get this archetype that they feel like they can't go away from without somehow violating what the class is. And that's just not true. Yeah, it's, it's nice to play these kind of cliché uh, build sometimes. Well, archetypal nothing... is more the right word oh, than yes. cliche. Yes, I agree. I just couldn't think of it. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. You can have a blast with them. Sometimes they're really fun. But you can do more. Yeah. Uh, I honestly like the idea of a barbarian who's very nice. He's a nice guy. He's very intelligent. But once he gets raged, he just goes all out on you. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that idea for a character. And it doesn't make him any less of a barbarian. It doesn't make him any less of a barbarian. The thing is, the more archetypal characters, uh, when you're a new player or a player who doesn't have much experience in RP, uh, generally limits your options in the party. Your responses are going to be very limited, and you just don't get the fun and openness of some of the more crazy, outgoing ideas for characters. Yeah. Like, to take a... Uh class which is often very stereotypical, like the bard. A lot of people play bards as kind of these outgoing, fun time, hard drinking guys, and bards can definitely be that, but they can also be a lot more. Like you could play a bard who's really kind of subdued and more like uh, a storyteller, or a bard who's really more about gathering information and almost like a spy. I did uh, a combination between kind of a, a spy kind of character with uh, kind of like Homer from uh, Greece. I, I did a, it, my thing was oratory and I did epic poems. And the whole thing I had was I was trying to write an epic poem. And it was really fun because then I had a reason to go out and do these crazy adventures because I needed a story just outrageously awesome. Yeah, one of the things which can really help uh, create your character's personality is having some kind of overall goal. Because, you know, just being, I want to seek my fortune and make my name as an adventurer, well, that's okay, but, you know, you're going to have kind of a generic character with generic motives for adventuring. It's a great place to start. Yeah. Uh, starting a game with a character that doesn't have much... And that's another thing, is people seem to think you need to have an entire uh, personality built when you start the game. That's not going to happen. And it shouldn't. Because the most fun you'll have is when your character grows. It's nice, and it's, it's a good thing to have a motivation, an overall arcing goal. But just keep in mind that your character's ideals and your character's feelings and beliefs will change over the course of the game. Mm -hmm. Especially when you're starting at level one, your character is essentially very new. They've sort of had some of their major cementing life experiences, but they've by no means had all of them. Another thing which also tends to detrimentally control some players' view on their character is race. So, you know, a lot of guys who play, say, an elf, you have to be the super elfy version of an elf. You know, I sit down, I commune with trees, I'm always very wise in all these situations. And that's not necessarily all that an elf can be. Some elves are, say, for example, like the feral elves, who are the really violent protectors of nature. That's another thing that you could do 
with an elf. Those are fun to go into barbarian with. And then you don't have a stupid human or, like, barbarian who grew up in the wastes with his tribe of nomads. No, you have this super feral elf who's angry at, at civilization. But, I mean, you have that racial bonus to intelligence. Like, you can be smart. In fact, I would recommend doing it because the barbarian can use those skill points. Mm -hmm. And you can have a lot more fun with this character who's more complex than just angry and stupid. Uh, we also see problems with people when they're doing, like, a paladin. And paladin is very restrictive, do not get me wrong. Yeah, it's one of the most restrictive classes. But everyone has a slightly different take on lawful good. And you can do more than just the knight who's out there, you know, huzzah to do the, the so slay I will the smite you, and, evil. Yeah, you can do more And then more rescue that. this kitten from a tree. <laughs> you can do more with him, and, and you should look at it and try to figure out ways you can do more with it. Yeah, one thing I would recommend you look at is uh, if you can get access to the 5th edition player's guide that has like three different versions of the paladin in it. One is the very archetypal Shining Knight. There's also, I think, the Oath of Vengeance paladin, which is almost a Judge Dredd version of a paladin where it's like, I'm here to kill evil, you know, no questions asked. And then there's kind of the nature paladin. The, the point is, I think, that when you're going to build a character... Don't always go for the easy route. Yeah. S sometimes it's better to go for a bit more complex and more fun because your reactions and your uh, intergroup dynamic can change a lot on that. And that is one way to make campaigns uh, kind of different from each other. Because if you come down to it, campaigns often you know, have the same linear story, kind of. Yeah, even if you're sticking with the same characters from campaign to campaign, you know, some players like to, some groups like to go from module to module, but, you know, this still kind of remains true. Mm -hmm. And especially with that, actually, because your character has even more time to grow and more time to face a death and rethink what they value most. I think it's always important to sit down and go, all right, so what has happened in this character's life, including during the game, to... Uh, make him introspective. Yeah. A third factor which really sort of limits what characters are about is alignment, and we touched on that with the paladin. But one of the very confusing ones is true neutral. It's like, uh, I see a lot of players, they sit down and they're like, I just don't know what to do as a true neutral. I feel like I have no motivation to actually do anything. And that's not true. True neutral is more about recognizing an authority beyond yourself, or that's one way to play true neutral. You often see true neutral druids, which are completely devoted to nature and like anything that, that is unnatural or that threatens the forest or the natural environment, like regardless of whether it's farms, like what, people expanding more farms so they can feed people to end famine. You know, a good character would be like, that's a great idea. True Neutral Druid would be like, get the hell off my lawn. Uh, another version of True Neutral are characters whose sole goal is to is to just amass power as much as they can, and they don't really care where they get it from. It's like, okay, to become more powerful, I'm willing to make deals with potentially evil outsiders. I'm willing to pursue, you know, questions and just set no limits on myself in how I accomplish that. Another way is to have yourself a very specific goal, and it should be a goal that doesn't like it doesn't end, per se. It shouldn't be something that's got a beginning and an end. It should be an ongoing goal for, like, if you hunt undead. Your entire life's purpose is hunting undead. Now, you'll do whatever is necessary to hunt undead. Yeah. So, if you have to break laws or do some questionable things in order to track down the undead to kill them... As long as the undead get killed, you don't particularly care. Yeah, and that also means working with allies that you might not necessarily want to work with, whether it's, say, uh, a lawful good paladin or a chaotic neutral sorcerer. You know, you're willing to, to work with the people you need to work with to destroy the enemy that you think needs to be wiped off the face of the earth. Another thing to remember is that while alignments 
uh, like you should stick to your alignment. You, one thing that isn't included in the alignment system that really you have to remember is your tendencies towards good and evil and law and chaos. So a chaotic neutral character doesn't always have to be just out for himself because a chaotic neutral character can have good tendencies where he sides more towards the good side of things or he can have evil tendencies and side more towards the evil things but he's still chaotic neutral because he doesn't go full into either one. Yeah. So your character's alignment isn't a straitjacket. It's not there to completely control how you act in a given situation. It's sort of what your character will lean to most often and what they're ultimately about. Because in any given situation, sometimes doing the right thing would benefit, say, a chaotic neutral character. Mm -hmm. And don't be afraid of your alignment changing. As long as you're a class that doesn't, you know, get hurt by that. Uh, it's not necessarily a bad thing. That just signifies you know, character growth. Your character idea when you went into this campaign was different than how your character is now. That's all it means. It means you went from going in as a, a survivor to do whatever it takes to survive all out for yourself, and, but the people you've been adventuring with have taught you something, and now you're a, a chaotic good. You're a, you want to do what's right to help other people. Yeah. So, with the lawful alignments, that's another one where there tends to be some confusion among people who aren't really familiar with the alignment system. Some people think that in order to be lawful, I need to follow all of the laws. That's not necessarily too, true. Like, monks are a good example. Sometimes a monk will still be lawful, even though he doesn't necessarily respect the laws of society around him, as long as he remains really true to his personal convictions. And we can see evidence in that with things like assassins, who are lawful evil, but work against the law. The idea is, is that there's a very strict code of conduct, a very professional code of conduct, conduct with assassins, where they only do things in a certain way, and that they won't go beyond that. Yeah, so that's uh, definitely one way you can have a lawful character and not be like that guy who's like, well, we're supposed to do this, this, and this because the rules say so. The point is, is you, you always don't be afraid to push boundaries or your comfort zone when you're making a character or when you're choosing to play a character. I think it's very important to remember that you are not your character. Now, your character will have some things in common with you. You can't avoid putting yourself in the character. But, remember, the character's circumstances, the character's life, and the character's way of thinking is not yours. It is different. And don't be afraid to try different combinations and new things that don't immediately sound right because they'll be more fun for everybody in the group to, to play around. Yeah, speaking of the group, another thing which I've seen before is wanting that immediate, like, camaraderie, getting the group together and just all being on the same page and feeling like a group that's been together forever through thick and thin, and that's not necessarily something you can create. No, that's something that grows. Because all of your characters are going to come together as strangers. They're not going to trust each other immediately. There's not going to be camaraderie. They're going to be a little guarded. But it will grow as they experience perils together. And as their experience level goes up and they level up further, they become more and more of a close-knit uh, community. And on an, another thing that I've seen that really bugs me is the belief that your party is out to get you. Like, I've seen people who assume that since your party members disagree on how to do something, that they are going to go behind your back and backstab you in order to do things how they want to. I normally don't agree with my party. However, I will always go with what the party decides to do. And you need to have trust in your, in your uh, party members that they will go with you. That whoever decides on the path, we're not just going to abandon you. We'll keep going with you. We might gripe about it. We always love to complain, but we're not going to leave you behind. Yeah, so this also comes with the warning of don't be that guy. Don't be that guy who's like, you know, 
I wouldn't involve myself in this fight. You know, I walk. Because that there is just going to kind of derail things. Potentially characters are going to die. That's and, called the TPK. Yeah. <laughs> That's called the TPK when one guy's like, you know, I wouldn't be involved in this fight. And I think that comes down to kind of a lack of imagination. Or it can come down to a lack of imagination on why your character is doing something. So to use uh, an extreme example, say there's a paladin who's going to be involved in an attack on a village where he knows there are women and children. And it's like, my character wouldn't take part in this attack. And so I guess my question would be, so there's absolutely no circumstance where your character would get involved in this. It's like, you wouldn't say, uh, be involved in a raid on a village to protect the innocent people in there. You don't think you could do more if you were there. It's just, this is one of the things as a player where you do maybe need to fudge it just a little bit to kind of keep the group dynamic strong, which is important to a successful party in my opinion. And when you're thinking about things like that, like that example, remember that, okay, your paladin doesn't want to kill women and children. Does that extend to the men in the village? Are those men armed and dangerous? Are they, do you have any reason to be hostile to them? You can still go on that raid. You just won't kill any women and children. Like, it doesn't mean you won't go. It just means that you have to limit your involvement, possibly. And you must try to limit your party's involvement by trying to keep your party from killing those women and children. Yeah. It's one of the challenging aspects of RP, which, uh, you know, tends to come up in games, but not get talked about a whole lot. Another thing that comes up that nobody talks about is that moment where two players won't back down from each other. Uh, that happens, and that's how people die. Uh, because when you have two players that are arguing, you need to seek a compromise. Every time. I've done this several times now, and every time it's ended up with the campaign being derailed because I won't back down and neither will the other person. So, just remember, you can convince your character to do just about anything with the right information. Exactly. Well, thank you for watching this video on the RP aspect of D&D. If you're interested in more of these, please let us know down in the comments. And if you want to see more character builds, class analysis, and strategy guides for Dungeons & Dragons or Pathfinder, check out D6 Damage right here on YouTube. Thank you for watching.